I want to be mindful of time, so I know we will still have some stragglers coming in, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I am Lauren Cook, your Dean of College and Gap Year Advising at JCHS. If we have not met in person yet, which may be true for a lot of the parents at least, um, I look forward to getting to know you as we continue this process. Um, I do just want to name that we have got your class Dean, Rabbi Josh Buchan in the room. Hello, Rabbi Buchan. Uh, he's going to be doing some tech support tonight as well as just kind of listening in um, about all of this as he also gets started on the college search process with all of you. Um, and I'm just going to do a couple of housekeeping items up top. Um, everyone is on mute now. That's always my default in my um, Zoom room. I'll ask you to stay that way as we're doing sort of um, some content and presentation here at the top. Um, when we are taking questions, we'll use the chat box, I think, because it's such a large group. Um, and if you have done any presenting on Zoom, you know that when you have slides up, which I'm going to do in a moment, it's hard to toggle between that and the chat box. So I'll let you know when it's time. And I appreciate um, the questions that folks put in there are SVP forms as well. We'll definitely address those. This meeting should run about an hour. Um, if we finish a little early, terrific. If you have a lot of questions, we are going to call it at eight and know that this is not your last time talking to me. In fact, you're going to get a lot of FaceTime with me. Um, and we're recording this. So if you do have to bow out early, or you want to just watch it again and hear all of this uh, fascinating information twice, I should hopefully have a recording out to you by the end of the week. Um, I also sent out an overview of the slides that I'm going to use. So if you do want to take some notes or if you just want to refer to them later, um, you should have those in your inbox. So with that, I'm going to do the whole sharing of the screen situation. Let's get that going. And all right, I think we're off. Whoops, and we're already in. There we go. Okay, so this is the official launch of your college search process. Um, so I hope that you're feeling like this is an exciting time. Um, this is when you can really start to think about life after high school, dream big about the options for yourself. You're going to have a lot of things to choose from. Um, if you're feeling not ready for college yet, that's okay because you're not going yet. We are starting a long-term project, right? This is going to be the next year and a half together. Um, and in fact, I was talking to some seniors today about the fact that this was the junior kickoff night and they were like, oh, it's been a year. How's it been a year? And they were saying to me, you know, I was listening to you a year ago and thought, I need to get my life together. I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's okay. I want you to remain calm during this next hour because we are just starting this together. Um, I think it's helpful to think about it like a marathon, you know, where we're going to have some check-in points along the way, or if you're a gamer, it's like a quest that we're going on where there are different stages and worlds that we're going to go through um, to get to an eventual goal, which is your plan after high school. But know that everybody's project or marathon or game is going to look different because you are all unique and different people, right? Um, your goals and dreams are going to be different. And while I hope that as a class, we'll be able to have a really good um, supportive community around the college search together, I'm gonna keep reminding you to keep this grounded in your own needs and wants and what's the best fit for you. Um, this is not about what your friends are doing. This is not about what your neighbor tells you to do. This is not about what the media says is important. Um, this is your one and unique life, right? And so this is a moment where you can really start taking the steering wheel with it. Now, remember, you're not doing this alone. Um, you have a team behind you. This will include your parents, of course. Um, a lot of faculty members at JCHS, and most especially those folks that may end up writing recommendation letters for you, which we will get to later in the year. Um, you might have some select friends you trust that you're talking with about your process, um, but you are the captain of your team. Um, I am your coach that is going to help uh, guide you along the way here. Um, and over the next year and a half, our goals are going to be, first and foremost, to just reflect on your time at JCHS and who you are right now and do some deep thinking about what you want for yourself next. This is your next JCHS, your next educational home. We're going to find some options that fit that vision for yourself, right? Um, I'm going to encourage you to heed my advice and guidance. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and I just want to pull over here and remind folks that while we're going to focus on the four-year college option tonight, because that is where the majority of JCHS students head, 
and that is the most um, complicated sort of and and um, and uh, long path um, that students have to go on. We do have students that choose two-year colleges, community colleges, that choose to enlist in the IDF, that may decide to access a gap year option. All of those things are viable and great options, um, but we're focusing on the four-year college path tonight because it is, um, you know, sort of the most complicated. Uh, so once we hopefully have some four-year options for you next spring, you'll be deciding between them and trying to figure out what the, the best match is for your goals post-JCHS. So that's the big picture. I'm actually going to encourage you to not think about the big picture so much because there are a lot of moving parts. It can be a little overwhelming to think about it as one big thing. Um, so we're going to do it in bite-sized chunks and, and in stages. And um, we're going to focus tonight on just the next few weeks. So an overview of what we're going to do, we're going to talk about your first steps here, um, how to kind of lay the beginning groundwork for your search. Um, we're going to bring in a guest speaker, Bruce Reed, who's in the room already. He's going to zero in on the testing portion of this groundwork. I know there's a lot of questions about testing. He's the co-founder and executive director of Compass Education Group, which is a great partner um, to JCHS in terms of the testing process. And then I'll do a little bit of a summary, a few reminders at the end, and then open up the floor for hopefully 10 or 15 minutes of question and answers if I and Bruce don't talk too much. So that's the plan. Um, all right, so let's get started with step one, which a lot of folks think um, is around, whoops, there we go, which is around starting with colleges and like, which colleges should I be looking at? But the first thing we're gonna do is actually jumping into who are you? And, and what are you bringing to this process? Because that's gonna inform the schools that we're looking at on your list. Keep in mind that there are 4,000 some colleges and universities in the country. We cannot begin to winnow down choices to a list of 15 or 20 that you may wanna be serious about without some understanding of who you are and what you're looking for. So I wanna introduce you to the concept of the five eyes, which are uh, my slides, if I could get these to work appropriately. There we go. Um, the five eyes come from this book that I really love called The College Conversation. Um, I have this in the College Advising Handbook, which I know you've already all read. Um, but if you haven't, this is a really excellent resource. It came out last year. I know both of the author authors. It's the Dean of Admission from the University of Pennsylvania and a former New York Times reporter um, for the education section. Um, it's a, really geared towards more parents than students, um, but really helps you think about how to frame the college search. And one thing that they talk about is these five eyes. Um, so we're looking at identity, you know, how do you see yourself? How do other people see you? How might that be important in terms of the college community you join? Intellectually, what's the best environment for you to learn? And this is something you can start thinking about now as you're going through your JCHS classes. Is the one-on-one -on -one kind of smaller classroom environment good for you? Or do you think you might be looking for something a little bit larger later on? Um, ideas, what kind of um, values are important to you and how might you want to see those reflected in the college community around you? Your interests, how do you spend your free time? Are those kind of activities and things going to be available on the campuses you're looking at? And then inspiration, like what motivates you? Who do you get excited by? And so what kind of students do you want to be surrounded by to help keep that inspiration and motivation up during your four years at college? So in practical terms, I really encourage students to start brainstorming these kind of answers. So whether that's like um, keeping a journal, opening a Google Doc, whatever works best for you, to, but to start asking these questions of yourself because this internal investigation is, is really important. And you don't have to have specific schools in mind or majors. Um, it's just a list of attributes that you're kind of looking for that you can use as a barometer as then you're looking at colleges and you learn more about them. The next step will be a college advising questionnaire. Everybody's gonna be getting a questionnaire in their inbox tomorrow. So that will be both parents and students. Um, this is a Google form where you're gonna share with me some preliminary thoughts, both about yourself and what you think you might be looking for um, from colleges. And uh, we'll say a little bit more about the questionnaires in a moment. And then one other activity that you can engage with is, um, 
the U Science Games in SCORE. And I know I talked about this at the beginning of the year. I sent out an orientation video to it. Some of you may have started or and a handful of you have even completed them. But if you haven't looked at these yet, um, this is a helpful sort of game tool to help you figure out how your brain works. And uh, like the old school sort of career surveys that your parents and I took back when we were in you know middle school and high school, it will talk to you about some potential career matches for you what majors lead to those careers. And then in SCORE, you can filter on those majors to see what colleges offer them. So this is another tool just in terms of thinking about who you are, what you're looking for, and what might be a good match for you. All right, so this is step one. Let's see if the slides will work here and move on to step two. Um, all right. There we go. All right, step two is finding the right college fit. Um, and this is really our mission. I want to be super clear about that. This should not be about associating yourself with name brands. Um, this is not about following your best friend to college, your girlfriend or boyfriend. You know, this is about finding the right fit for you. And so um, I like to talk about four specific factors for fit that you should be thinking about that kind of guide how we're going to create your list. So um, the first two are pretty obvious. Academically, um, does the colleges that you're looking at, do they have the programs that you're thinking about? Are those programs strong? Socially, do they have um, the right kind of social and extracurricular opportunities? Will your identity, your values, um, ideas kind of be valued there? Do they have uh, you know, the things that you are looking for outside of the classroom? There's a lot of resources to help us sort out the academic and social kind of options that are out there and which schools are going to be a good fit. But these next two, you know, can you pay for the college? That's a huge question. And can you get in? Are a little less clear, a little harder to predict. And so how do we figure out fit? Um, so I'm going to recommend that you start doing some research. Um, there are three uh, real resources that I'm a fan of. SCORE, obviously, there's a lot of search functions in SCORE. Some of you already are following schools and looking at things there. If you're not yet, that's okay. Um, but SCORE is a really good place to start. There's another great search website that's run by the College Board. It's called Big Future. Um, that also has a lot of different filters and things you can put in, whether you're looking for uh, folks that have you know, active Hillels and biology programs and are in the Midwest, you can get really specific and it'll give you um, great lists of colleges. And then I'm also a huge fan of the Fisk Guide to Colleges. Um, this is the most popular college guide in the country. I have probably 10 copies of it in my office that you're welcome to borrow, but you may have a copy yourself, especially if you've got multiple kids in the family. Um, it's worth investing in. Um, they give some really even-handed descriptions of colleges that are not written by the colleges. Most of what you're going to get is a lot of propaganda from colleges and what you see on websites. Everything's going to sound great. But the FIS guide does a pretty accurate job of telling you if a school, um, you know, is kind of a party place or if it's got a real thriving geek culture, you know, that they give some pretty accurate third party sort of descriptions. So these are ways you can start to learn about individual schools. And then when we have our initial college advising meeting, um, which we will get to in a moment, I'm gonna make some recommendations on schools based on the things that we talk about, this, the questionnaire that you do for me. And so I'm gonna want you to look at my suggestions and what, as well um, as whatever you may have in SCORE um, and see if any of them feel like a good fit for you. And then you're gonna to start to attend things. I'm gonna want you to go on some campus visits, information sessions, whether that's virtually or actually in person, get on some mailing lists for colleges so that you're starting to get some emails and being notified about news on campus and you know, events that they're gonna be holding so that you can collect information right from the source. All right, so I wanna to return to those four factors of fit for a moment. Um, again with the slides, there we go. Um, so I want to go back to this last question of can you get in, because I think uh, that this is, you know, a tricky one to sort of suss out on your own, um, and I'm going to, of course, going to, going to help you with this, um, but I do want to just clarify something here. If we were in person, this is where I would ask all of you, what do you think is the average acceptance rate for colleges in the country? Um, and when we've done this in the theater in person, you know, some folks have said, oh, I think it's 10% or 15% or, you know, the real pessimistic among you will say like 6% of people get into colleges across the country. 
I want to make sure you know that the average acceptance rate nationally for college right now is 68%. So the vast majority of colleges admit the vast majority of their applicants, right? You are going to go to college <laughs> in a year and a half. Um, but we tend to focus on 50 to 100 of them that have these teeny tiny acceptance rates, right? Uh, and they're really the outliers. But because we're human and we like to associate with places that might not want us, right? We, we focus on them. So it's worth reviewing the factors in college admission. So if you are interested in one of those, you know, 50 to 100 colleges with these, these smaller admit rates, um, what they are looking at specifically. So what is in an application? This is the sort of standard list of things and really the most exhaustive list of things. Places like the UCs um, ask for fewer things than this list, but this would be something that most private colleges are going to want to see, some out of state public schools. This is what an exhausted list of um, uh, pieces of an application will look like. Um, I will go through each of these things with students individually. We will talk about um, all of these various pieces that you'll have, and I support you in working on each of these. So whether it's your essay writing, whether it's making your testing plan, advice on who to ask for recommendation letters, et cetera, prepping for interviews, we'll work on this all together. And I wanna pause on this last bullet point of expression of interest, because folks don't always know what that means. I've referenced this in some emails earlier in the year when I was encouraging you to go to college visits uh, at JCHS this fall. There is a thing called demonstrated interest in the college admission process. Not every college cares about it. Um, for example, the University of California, again, they're trying to have a very equitable system, so they're not tracking your interactions with them. But on the other end of the spectrum is a place like Tulane, who cares a lot about your interaction with them. So if you email someone at Tulane, if you go to a JCHS college visit from the Tulane rep, if you visit Tulane's campus, they're keeping track of all of that and kind of checking off boxes on their end because they are more interested in admitting folks who've had that level of engagement with them. The theory is that you are more likely to apply and enroll um, if you've demonstrated interest. So for some institutions, and again, I'll give you guidance if those end up on your list, showing um, some expression of interest is important. Okay, so these are things that you control for the most part, right? You know, you are working towards your grades, you are working on that essay, you are choosing the activities you're involved with. Um, but there are another set of factors that are a little bit beyond your control. And sometimes, especially when admission decisions come in, students start complaining to me, this process is so random, you know, it's like a lottery, that person got in, but this person didn't. Um, while it doesn't always make sense, this process is not random. And when students mention that, it's usually because they don't understand the idea of priorities or hooks, as sometimes folks call it in the college admission process. Um, this is additional criteria, as I said, that sometimes beyond your control that also factor in. So what are some of these things? Some of these may look familiar to you, especially as we think about like the Varsity Blues college admission scandal a few years ago. There's a lot of talk about recruited athletes and whether or not some of those kids applying to places were actually athletes or had had their heads photoshopped on somewhere. Anyway, if you are a recruited athlete, you know, if you are really great at crew or basketball or football, um, you will receive some, some special preference in the process at certain schools. Um, same things for what we call legacy students. If you had a parent attend that school or one of your siblings is currently there, that can give you a little advantage. Um, VIP candidates, um, this is not just, uh, you know, your parents can af afford to pay your full tuition to college. It's more like they could afford to buy a building on the college campus, right? Colleges love that. Um, if you are a non-white student, um, highly selected colleges in this country remain overwhelmingly white. And so if you are bringing something else to the table, that might be compelling uh, to a college admission office. Same thing with first generation to college students. And then there's a broader category of school specific priorities. Um, this could be all sorts of things. They don't have anyone from North Dakota right now, right? And they wanna be able to say they have all 50 states. So suddenly those two applicants from North Dakota are getting a lot of attention. They might need a tuba player. They might have a new data science program that they wanna fill. And so if you're interested in that, it's like you've won the jackpot. Um, so know that uh, we will review your factors and priorities if you have any in the process at certain schools. You can also ask colleges if there are certain types of students that they're looking for, especially when it comes to those student specific priorities. Many will be transparent with you. It's, it's okay to ask that question. Uh, but these things will help us know if you can get in, 
if you can pay for it, because sometimes there is money attached to these priorities like athletic scholarships. Um, so this is another layer of things that we will talk about in some of our individual meetings. All right, there's a lot of information. We're gonna get down to the nitty gritty of sort of the first steps of what's actually happening. So again, I said uh, we are going to do questionnaires starting tomorrow. Um, I think they're coming at like 8 a.m. in your inboxes. Um, and this is gonna help us start the conversation about what are your factors for fit, how to make that initial list. These questionnaires are optional for parents. They're required for students. So juniors, you cannot sign up for your first college advising meeting with me until I've received that questionnaire back from you. And the questionnaire, you know, has questions about just sort of who are you? What has your experience been like at JCHS? What do you think right now you might want for your future? I know that this may change and that's okay. Just this is a snapshot in time of where you are now. If you have any colleges on your radar or not, whatever the answer is to that question, that's okay. But as I said to juniors in our class meeting last week, it's really important to fill this out carefully. This is a chance to be reflective and it's for me to get to know you, but it's also the beginning of your recommendation letter. And I have to write a recommendation letter for every single one of you. So if you give me a one sentence answer to some of these questions, um, it's not that I'm gonna write a one sentence recommendation letter, but it's gonna be hard for me to fill that page the way I really want to. So please be thorough, take some time with this. Um, and then parents, I hope that you'll do this. If you have time, it's really great to have your voice in the process and on the record. Of course, we will have meetings and all of that, but having something in print from you is great. You know, what should I know about your child? Um, what are your aspirations for your kids? Are any schools important to your family? Um, anything else contextually I should know? So, um, so as much time as you have to spend on this as well would be great. Once I get that questionnaire in, um, we will then uh, start scheduling those initial college advising meetings. Um, the first appointments are next Monday. So if you get that questionnaire in the next few days, you can just start the process um, rolling here. And I'll be doing those meetings throughout December and January. Um, everyone does need to meet with me. So if you're a little slow on the questionnaire, I am gonna start uh, nagging you about it probably around winter break. Um, and then after uh, we have those appointments, um, I am going to make an initial college list for you. Um, and I'll usually do that list the same day, a couple hours after our meeting. If you have no schools in SCORE that you're following, um, this will be your initial list. Um, if you have schools that are in SCORE, I'm gonna just round things out a little bit um, and make some other suggestions, perhaps places that you haven't heard of yet, but that I think might be a good fit for you. We will also in those meetings talk about your recent practice test results. And we're obviously gonna get into testing here tonight, um, but some of you have your ACT practice results back, but of course the PSAT is coming back next week. So this will be a moment where we can talk about if you're going to think about testing as part of your path, and if so, which test we should pursue um, and move on from there. Um, and then, I will hope that you'll get started on some research and getting on those mailing lists, start doing some virtual visits, if not some in-person visits starting, you know, spring break and, and later on. Um, parents know that after this initial meeting, which is just me and the student, I am happy to answer email questions. We can do some Zooming family meetings that I'm hoping in spring semester, we might actually be able to all be in person um, to have some conversations. And know that there will be, spoiler alert, um, three, at least three sort of coffee with Miss Cooks early in 2022, which I tend to do first thing in the morning for an hour on Zoom, where it's just an open forum for me to have um, Q&A with parents about the process. So, and I record those as well. So if you can't make it, um, you can always um, jump in and just hear the conversation after the fact. Okay, there's been a lot of information. We're gonna pause on the whole big picture thing and drill in specifically on testing. It is the most changing and fluid part of the process. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here for a moment and bring in Bruce Reed. See if I can pin your video for everyone. Um, Bruce is the co-founder and executive director of Compass Education Group. It's a tutoring company that provides one-on-one -on -one test prep, um, including for many of our families. A lot of folks have been very happy working with Compass. They're recognized as one of the nation's leading experts on standardized testing research, higher education trends. They know everything that's happening. They know when there's an error on a test. They are amazing. And um, we're really lucky to have Bruce with 
us tonight. Um, I have synthesized, compiled some of the questions and themes that came from the RSVP questions you guys all put in. So um, know that we might not get to the particulars of your family specific situation. We're gonna talk a little bit more big picture, um, but we can dig into your specifics in those one-on-one -on -one meetings. So Bruce, thank you for being here. Yeah, happy to be back, thank you. Yeah, um, so the first sort of big question here is around just generally, the testing patterns and behaviors that have kind of changed since the pandemic as this big disruptor. So can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? I'm sure you could spend an hour on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've spent the last year and a half sort of tracking the evolution as, as you said, it's ever changing and, and fluid. Um, it's, it's bouncing back, things have sort of rebounded. I think the class of 21 represented a, a bottom. Um, but just sort of the way to, I think, think about what has what has shifted is testing has gone from uh, a requirement to a very individualized discretionary decision, right? Which brings both freedom and optionality and perhaps some paralysis by analysis and confusion, right? So maybe we can help bring some of some clarity. I can't give a room full of people, you know, a single answer of, of to the question of should I or should I not test? But I think we can give some guidance on how do I approach that kind of question? How do I make that question uh, individualized and how do I make a smart decision for me? I think the basic guidance I would give is the choice has now been shifted to you. So that should feel empowering rather than intimidating. Um, I think you do need to trust colleges at their word when they tell you that they will fairly evaluate you with or without test scores. Some of that gets into gray area because of the history that that particular school has had with testing, its own attitude, and the signal it's sending you right now as to how it's couching its, its test optional policy. Is it a temporary concession? Have they gone permanent? Have they gone all the way to test free? So there's you know, a real spectrum. As you said, there's 4,000 schools. You could put those 4,000 schools on a spectrum, and I could almost put them in probably four or five different categories with respect to this monolithic term test optional, which is really not uh, you know, necessarily the, the, same, the same policy in practice at every school. But I would tell a student that if you feel that testing is going to undermine your application, it's going to take away from your story. It will fail to reinforce your application. Then you're now in an era where you can sort of free yourself from that stress and burden and, and move on with confidence through the application process without test scores. However, if you don't fear that, <laughs> if you think that testing with some reasonable amount of effort and maturity and practice and focus can... Um, can do something for you or can potentially do something for you, then I think the more prudent move is to not think of this as a test optional question, but rather a submit optional question. And I think most students we're seeing now from the class of 23, as test centers are opening up again, as the country is sort of cautiously opening up again, we're starting to see testing bounce back. So it seems as though as much as we look at the different data to sort of read what's driving behaviors, it seems that the biggest driver was shutdowns and the, and the public health factors. And as we've seen the country reopen geographically, different regions, we've seen testing sort of track uh, correspondingly. So it seems as though the more prudent move that students is are taking is retain scores, retain that option, and then address that option in the fall of senior year. And that might be very strategic. In fact, the last statistic I'll leave you with that I just, um, or that I'll leave this question with, that I saw recently was out of the Common App data where they measure what's known as strategic submissions. So a strategic submitter is a student who has test scores, submits scores to some schools, but not all schools. And that number used to be very, very low. It used to be, you'd either be sending your scores or you wouldn't. Now, in this era of widespread test optionality, you're seeing that number increase, which really shows that students are taking sort of um, control of this, of this option and exercising it case by case at individual schools.
Thank you. That's great advice. And I know there were some questions on the RSVP form of like, how do I know what a good score is? Right. And how do I know if I should submit or not? And so students know that this is something that I will work with you on school by school. And I literally right. have seniors coming in every day saying yeah. like, should I send to this school or not? So you'll yeah. get advice. On sure. That. I, I, and I would generally say, we, and you'll give the you'll give the granular circumstantial advice when you get down into specifics, because it's so hard to ha answer that question hypothetically. I will say, though, that if you feel like it's a tough decision, you should probably send them. If it's a close call, don't don't worry. <laughs> it's probably close enough to send and will do no harm. And it's probably better. And it just that way, it just sort of removes all uncertainty that maybe you were trying to hold an abnormally low score or there's any sort of interpretation of as to why there isn't a score present. I don't think you need to sort of uh, fixate on like what the highest possible score must be for them to, you know, give me any sort of, 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 of extra credit. In many cases, and this was true before test optional, test scores didn't really move the needle one way or the other. They sort of held the needle in place. And if your score just kind of holds things in place, I think I'd still submit it. So then let's talk about the UC announcement um, that they are now sort of done with testing. Right. Um, what should families make of this? What do you think this means for other colleges? Yeah, so that's a two-part question. What, what should families make of it? What does it mean for the rest of the country? I'll, I'll kind of take them one at a time. So this is sort of old news that got, a, that got a refresh recently. So the old news, when I say old, about a year ago, um, for lots of reasons. I won't go into all of them, but they I'll, I'll say that they went beyond just the pandemic and they got into legislative issues at the state level with regard to Prop 209. But a, a whole slew of, of factors sort of came together and uh, led to the UC system going test free or test blind as, as we sometimes refer it, meaning SAT and ACT scores are not used at all in the admission process. Now they can be used for placing into higher level classes at the UCs and there's some other secondary uses. But as of last year, uh, UCs went away from using SAT and ACT scores in the admission decision process. It was technically a temporary policy. And the news you're referring to Lauren is about a week or so ago that became codified as, as permanent. We all kind of expected it would. But they said they wanted a year to kind of think about it and maybe explore alternative exams. And unsurprisingly, they found no other um, viable solution. So yes, you can take that. In some ways, I think test-free is a very simple uh, policy. There's not a lot of analysis there. You don't send scores. It's as simple as the opposite, opposite extreme, which would be requiring test scores, right? You do, what, you do what's required. Here, you don't have a choice. Perfect scores, you can't send them. Um, so a lot of people are celebrating it, although, you know, there are people out there with very, who are very strong test takers who think, you know, this is actually taking away something that I'd be able to, to tout. As far as what it means for other schools, I would not read into this too much, especially where you are right now, because I don't see, I've seen the hypotheses out there that, you know, where California, you know, California is America just sooner, you know, and whatever happens in California is going to eventually happen across the country. There are a whole bunch of reasons why that's not necessarily going to be the case. The UCs are effectively legislated in this state as a public entity, as a public in higher ed institution, not to use these test scores. And I'm not going to go into all of the reasons why, but it has to do with legislation that is not necessarily in place in all other states. There are about nine other states where this could potentially uh, play out in similar ways. I also don't uh, think that just because California exports a lot of students to other states and they are ostensibly not required to um, test for their in-state public institution, I don't think that necessarily means that a, a serious California applicant is just going to give up his or her hope to apply to XYZ private university in the Midwest or the East Coast because a test is still being considered. So I'm not really ready to, to say that everyone's just going to follow the UCs. I know that a lot, there's still a lot of ambivalence privately. You know, you don't hear this discussed publicly, 
but I have a lot, you and I, Lauren, have a lot of private conversations with college higher ed policymakers. And it's not as simple as just everybody's sort of dancing on the grave of tests. There is still some real value institutionally to having access to testing data. And whether, so if we're, we're sort of finding that the, happy, the happiest middle ground for now is test optional. So they know they're getting enough scores to sort of make some predictive modeling around yield and around um, sort of shaping their class while still giving individual students the latitude not to submit. So I kind of think test optional is probably here to stay. I don't think we're gonna see a big move now to, to eradicating tests altogether, certainly not by next year. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was going to say. At least for this class, it's not going to be you know, a landslide, but yeah. that's super helpful. So this begs the question, uh, how should families know if testing makes sense for them or not? So what would you well, say? again, I, I would lean toward, this is going to sound biased as a test prep person. I'm a pro-testing person. I do believe in the value of testing. I also don't think students should fear testing unless they have real reason to fear it. It's, they've always struggled with it. It's always come up short. It causes an extraordinary level of, of stress. Now you have ways to avoid it. But most students who you see in college now, when you see their scores, their finished scores, you're seeing their finished product. If you could roll back the clock to when they were in 10th or 11th grade taking practice tests or their first PSAT or their practice ACT, it was a mixed bag. So most, I wouldn't react, overreact to an, to an initial practice test score and think, you know, we've got to give up on testing. I still believe that testing, acquiring test scores is still going to, all things being equal, um, give you more options as a senior to make those decisions school by school. Now, um, I think sort of a, a tangential sort of derivative of, of the question you're asking is when I'm looking at a specific school, if I'm looking at a specific school that claims to be test optional, how do I, how do I read into that? Or should I read into that? And there are a few ways, I guess, to sort of qualify um, a school's position on, on test optional. One would be to look back at its history with testing. What was it doing before the pandemic? Bowdoin's been test optional. Bates has been test optional for 40 years. So you can, <laughs> you can trust that they have got their system down and they really do mean it. And it was a philosophical move and it's been a philosophical ethos of theirs to, um, to really celebrate and embrace students with or without test scores. You've got, so that's one group, you know, the pre-pandemic test optional schools. Those would be schools where I would be most confident not sending scores. The next group would be um, those who were leaning, and you can look this all up. This is all sort of documented, and you can ask these questions of colleges. Don't be afraid. Ask Lauren. Ask. Reach out to us. We have all this information. Um, when you went test optional during the pandemic, did you go permanent, or are you taking it very sort of year by year or are you just on a trial are you are you describing it in your in your in your policy as due to the pandemic or um, if you're unable to test we will we will uh, we will still sort of consider your applicant so is there any reluctance or ambivalence in their statement um, if they are highly selective and temporary I would treat the, that combination as a school that prefers to see test scores. I really would. Now, it doesn't mean you can't, they're not going to, it doesn't mean you can't get in without, but it probably means that they are a culture that has been accustomed to test scores. They're comfortable interpreting test scores and all things being equal, they would prefer to see your test scores. Great. That's super helpful. Yeah. Um, so, of course, then we have the question about test prep. Um, so, you know, folks are going to be getting their practice tests back and we're going to have some conversations about which test to pursue and all the rest. So once we've decided, yeah, you need to run with, say, the ACT, what kind of advice do you have about preparing for the test and what's the, the range of ways that you could do that? 
Well, there is a range. And, you know, this is going to sound very biased because I'm going to speak from my, as an owner of a test prep company, I'm going to basically speak to the values that I espouse <laughs> at Compass, which is sort of what we built our model on, which is uh, common sense, um, a reasonable amount of time and energy and effort and expense devoted to it, finite, um, targeted. So what that generally means, for because I always read these articles about like the that that horrific test prep horror story that you hear about where mom got mom or dad got the students started in the third grade and they've been doing 7,000 hours a year for, it's like, I've never met anyone like that in the real world. So I don't know where these, these um, exaggerations come from. At Compass, we generally work with, fam with a student about once a week for about an hour and a half for two to three months <laughs> leading up to a test date. So yes, it's an extra thing to do, but it's temporary, it's reasonable, it's spread out over a manageable amount of time so that it can be incorporated into, into your existing schedule. You don't have to quit your sport or drop out of the school play or drop off the newspaper to just do it. I'm not a big fan of the extremes. I don't like boot camps in the last week. I don't like marathon programs that last six months. I think the test deserves some intentional focus. I think you should, if you're gonna take this test, I think you should prepare for it in some way. You could do it by, by yourself. You could do it online through an online sort of autonomous, you know, but guided study, like a driver's ed sort of um, style online class. You could work with a group. You could work with an individual tutor. So whatever sort of fits your uh, specific set of needs, there's a whole range of options out there. But expose yourself to a regimen, a weekly commitment, schedule it yourself or, or work with someone like a third party that's going to in, in sort of a, hold you accountable to a, to a schedule, incorporate real good, real authentic and high quality um, test material. So homework drills, problem sets, practice questions, expose yourself to real practice tests. So full length practice tests, maybe once a month over the course of a two to three months. So you've taken two or three practice tests in, in, in those sittings so you feel endurance build up and get that feedback and, and, and use the evaluation um, that you get back from those, those graded dry runs to sort of course correct and really use mistakes as your case studies. So we're a big, you know, we're, we're very big on, on using um, your, your errors <laughs> to learn from, right? And making sure that by the time we sort of um, disentangle this, you could, you could not only understand this question, but you could, you could teach it back to us now. So um, really understanding where I'm losing points, how this test is, is constructed, and how I can walk into it in April or May, anticipating what this test does. So, you know, that's, that's basically test prep in a nutshell, but there are lots of different ways to do it. Awesome. Thank you. We will pause there for a moment to go back to my slides and then uh, bring Bruce back when we uh, do a little Q&A here. So, all right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen one more time. So a couple of just wrap up things on standardized tests. Um, we will talk about this in that first college advising meeting. So thinking about um, SAT versus ACT, we're gonna compare if you did both practice tests, maybe you already know which one you wanna pursue, maybe you're already prepping, that's fine. Some of you are a little ahead of the game, but for the rest of you, we will talk about both. Um, and really the goal, if you're gonna move forward with testing, and again, we'll talk about whether it makes any sense for you to plan to not test or whether we keep moving the ball forward here. Um, trying to do it twice before you're into senior year is usually my goal. And so looking at um, the test dates on the calendar and then kind of working backwards 
as Bruce has noted, you know, to the two to three months before that test date, to, that's your concentrated time to test or to prep, and it should be sort of finite um, and short term. Um, we can talk about how you'll prepare for it, whether you're just going to get a study book, whether you're going to do some Khan Academy online, whether you want to access a place like Compass. Um, we think Compass is a great partner, but there are a lot of other test prep companies as well that often will send us gift cards or things. So I will push out all sort of offers to you as they come to me. Um, I do encourage folks to register early. And right now there is a little bit of uh, a competition for some seats in the spring. There seem to be more available for, for ACT than SAT. So we will cross that bridge again when we come to it, but as, as early as you can register um, to at least hold that date would be smart. Um, if you honor Shabbat, you wanna have a Sunday sitting, that's totally possible as well. So I can help you navigate that in or registering and then if you have any testing accommodations and you haven't had a conversation with Ms. Krieger about starting to get that formal approval process going, um, then, then we'll want to get that going as well because she does have to apply for your accommodations from the ACT or from College Board that does the SAT. And they often approve them, but not always. So you do need to talk with her about the documentation that might be required and then we'll kind of get that off and wait to make sure that, that you've got what you need. So again, we'll do some of that in your first one-on-one -on -one meetings. Now, before we wrap up, I want to just address really quickly, I get a lot of questions from parents about how you can assist with this process, the best way to engage with this process. So I'm gonna run through a couple of quick um, do's with the process. It's great if you are partnering with me on managing the timeline here. Um, I will send a lot of emails out. There's a lot of checklists. You don't have to sort of mysteriously figure out what the timeline is, but as I'm sending out reminders to help echo those a little bit at home, nudge a little bit gently around making sure that, that everybody's staying on task. Um, helping to schedule college visits. So whether that's booking some um, information sessions, tours, the flights, all that kind of thing, obviously we're gonna need your uh, credit cards involved in some of this planning process. So, so helping um, to navigate some of those visits. Um, and then also registering students for testing again um, and uh, using that credit card to make sure they've, they've got everything booked up to look at other funding options for colleges and know that I'm gonna be presenting you with a lot of resources about the whole topic of paying for college. We will have a couple of um, financial aid sessions in the um, early part of 2022 and into the spring. So keep an eye on your email for those, um, but you'll also wanna do some of your own research and learning about this. Eyes on you. Oop, and then I think we've got someone not on mute. Okay. Um, we also want you to be selective about where you are getting some college advice. Fact check the admission things that you're hearing from friends. This can be kind of the biggest time suck for you, for me, for your kids. Um, if you hear or read something that feels especially worrying or alarming to you, um, check with me because there is so much white noise around this process. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, there are a lot of people trying to make money off of your anxiety. Let's just be clear on that. So as much as you can try not to fall for it, or if you're not sure if you're falling for something, please pick up the phone or drop me an email and just say, oh, is this something that's real or I should worry about? And I can help you kind of parse out um, what is something that we need to pay attention to and what's just really um, you know, uh, an exaggeration. And then I'll also say that I want to make sure that uh, folks stay behind the white line. And so what's the white line? What's a white line violation? Uh, the first would be talking about college all the time. This is what I hear from your kids most often. They come into school and they say, Ms. Cook, my mom is asking me about college every day at breakfast and I'm, I'm really, I've had it. So for the sake of your relationship and the last year and a half you may all have in your home together, um, please try and compartmentalize this a little bit, whether that's picking a time, you know, at this point in the process, once every other week to maybe have a little college conversation would be great. As you get into the summer or senior year, maybe you set aside an hour on Sundays or Wednesday nights or something to just kind of check in, but please don't do this every day. Um, know that I'm keeping an eye on them every day. They'll see me every day. I will cause enough college anxiety about whether they're on track. Um, please also discourage your family members from regularly asking about this. We just wanna like keep it in proper perspective. 
Um, now, aside from scheduling some actual visits, please don't get real involved with contacting colleges on your child's behalf. If you are sending them emails asking questions about social life or majors or faculty members or all that, that's really should be um, in your students' hands. They should be taking some of the responsibility for this process. And then of course, when you visit, um, it is really helpful if you are not, woo, sorry, um, more memorable than your child by asking all of the questions on the college campus tour. I see this frequently where there is a parent monopolizing um, the tour guide's time. Um, so this is a moment to let your child step forward and ask questions, to let other students on the tour step forward and ask questions, bite your tongue as much as you can. Um, and then this last bullet point, it should go without saying, but there's no writing, typing, or submitting applications on behalf of your child. This is a rite of passage that they need to go through on their own. Um, and if you feel that they are really going to struggle doing this piece of the process, then perhaps we also need to have a conversation about whether this is the right moment for college or whether thinking about a gap year and some other things so then we get to a point um, where they are able to take ownership for the process. Okay, so now to my last slide. This is just the general recap reminder before we open up here for the last few minutes of questions. Um, you're going to start working on questionnaires, maybe tomorrow, maybe in the next few days, so then we can schedule that first college advising appointment. You're going to think about these five eyes. You're going to think about the U science games. We're going to start talking about your testing plan, if applicable for you, and that'll be something you'd be working on the next few months along with researching colleges. This will take us on through the end of the uh, school year. And then we need to remember you're still in your junior year and we want you to enjoy it and have fun. So um, balancing all of these things, none of these things need to be done right at this moment, but we are gonna start multitasking through them. And I'll keep reminding you if you're sort of falling behind on any one of these things. All right, I am going to pause there, stop sharing my screen go back to the full view here and we have eight minutes left. You've got Bruce and I here. So if folks have general questions at this moment that they feel like we didn't address, want to put them in the chat box, now would be your moment, um, knowing that we will have a lot of other time for follow-up as well. I know this has been a long 53 minutes packed with information. So any questions for Bruce or I? Not seeing anything yet. All right, we've got some. I've heard some schools have gotten rid of legacy consideration. Is that true? That is true. I believe Amherst College, I'm looking at Bruce, was that the most recent announcement uh, that came up? But yes, I think uh, a lot of schools are paying more attention to the equity issue. Um, both in light of the Varsity Blues admission scandal and this, you know, looking at all these sort of side doors into institutions, as well as, you know, a lot of the racial justice protests the summer of 2020, just really thinking about how this process can be more equi equitable. So yes, there are some schools that are starting to say we are not looking at any family connections to a college. And for anyone thinking about the UCs, they have never cared about legacy considerations. So sorry, mom or dad, if one of you went to Berkeley, Berkeley won't care <laughs> when they're thinking about um, your child's application. So we can talk, you know, school by school about what this might mean and where um, parent alma maters are. Does legacy apply to siblings? It sure does. Um, and those are usually the two categories. Parents and siblings are usually the most important. If great Aunt Barbara went to the school, that's amazing, but they're probably not going to think that's a big deal unless great Aunt Barbara's name is on a building, so to be kind of crass. Um, okay, another question. For students who didn't attend this session, will they be encouraged to watch the recording? Um, so, or will it be redundant? So one thing, we did have a class meeting last week. Most of the juniors were there where I gave a little preview of this, uh, tried to underscore how important the questionnaires are and some of the things that are coming. So for most students, this is the second time that they're hearing this. Um, but yeah, what you are going to start with those questionnaire emails tomorrow at 8 a.m. Um, is just a landslide of emails from Ms. Cook. Um, you are really going to have a full inbox in the next year and a half. And I won't contact you every day. I try not to spam, but there's going to be a lot of information, a lot of class meetings, a lot of, if I've not heard from you, kind of seeking you out during study hall, stalking you a little bit in the comments. So um, yes, I will be encouraging lots of follow-up uh, and making sure that, that everybody's um, 
hitting all the markers in the process as we go along. And that questionnaire will be the first one. If my student is planning on a gap year, would you still do the process as you described? Such a good question. Short answer, yes. Um, the gap year process, it, you know, we have anywhere from a quarter to a third of JCHS graduating students going on a gap year each year. It is a really big chunk of the class each year. And most of those students have gone through the process with everyone else while they have access to me, to faculty. Um, and most of them have applied to college, gotten in somewhere, and that place is saving a spot for them. And that's sort of the ideal scenario. Um, I think it's good to go through the motions with your classmates, to have those recommendation letters on file, to, to go through this process while they've got support. In a rare instance or two, someone will go on a gap year and not have a college plan or change their college plan during that time. I still support students after they graduate. We have a lot of folks that bounce back after they get out of the IDF or they transfer, you know, and so I'm, I'm still here to help after that time. But unless you have signed a gap year contract, you know, in September of senior year, which nobody does, um, I would still go through the motions because again, students are teenagers and they can change their mind too. And so we want to just keep all the doors open until the moment when we start deciding to close some of them. Um, question about any high level guidance for fitting college side with students, personality, learning style, et cetera. So um, yeah, size is a question that comes up a lot in some of uh, the early conversations. It is not uncommon for students to say, JCHS is so small, I wanna go somewhere bigger than JCHS. I wanna go to a big school. So I'm just gonna state for the record here, everything is bigger than JCHS. I don't know one college that is smaller than JCHS. So um, even some of the teeniest, tiniest places. So anything's gonna be bigger. And so it's going to be a question of what's the right size for you. And so I'm gonna push kids because some wanna go straight to the sort of UC conversation, which can be a great fit for a lot of folks, but going from 200 to 25,000 is a big leap and it is not right for everybody. So um, I'm really gonna push folks to think about what it means to be anonymous, what it means to be standing in line and part of a bureaucratic machinery, what it means to have you know, more advising and some of the safety nets that you've had at JCHS and really think about what's the best fit for you. All right, we've got a question about college guidebooks, publishing median test scores, how best to use this data, if your score is in the top 50%, bottom 20%. Yeah, so, so this is to Bruce's point, the question about submission. Um, so I think a lot of you are gonna wanna test, and then we're gonna get to this question of do you actually submit your test score or not? And Bruce, do you have anything to say about understanding those median test scores? And Yeah, so the only... <laughs> This is kind of ironic to say this, but this is where using slightly older information is probably better. <laughs> um, taking pandemic era data, taking specifically the class of 2021, we've always said parents, counselors, we've always said, you know, the best, one of the best ways to learn about predicting and establishing my behavior for next year is to look at last year. Probably not. <laughs> um, the class of 21 is probably going to go down as such an odd year in terms of student behavior and admission outcomes. And some of that is going to be reflected in, some, in statistics that just maybe shift one way or the other temporarily. So I'd look at pre-pandemic averages, first of all. Um, and when I would just be a little careful when you start looking at highly selective schools that have these very sort of intimidating narrow ranges at the top that feel, you know, unreachable and think anything other than those I shouldn't send, I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, if it's way out of range, probably better to leave it out of the, out of the picture. If it's, you know, just sort of right on the, on the, on the cusp of the lower half of the middle 50%. So Scott, I think what you're referring to is generally they, the most common way they produce, they publish data is middle 50th. So they take the 25th to 75th percentile of the, of the class. Um, and if you're sort of right on the lower end of that middle 50, you're still, you're still very much in the middle of, of their admitted numbers. So I think you're still in safe territory quite a bit below that, maybe you'd leave it out. The other thing to watch for is colleges love to um, inflate their numbers creatively. And one of the things they'll do, and you have to be careful what you're looking at, is are they showing you 
their admitted averages or their enrolled averages, because admitted averages are always going to be higher. Because if, if Lauren gets a perfect 1600 on the SAT and applies to five schools and she gets into all five, all five of those schools are counting her in their average, right? They're taking credit for her score, even though she's only going to attend one of them. So the enrolled numbers always kind of come down quietly in the fall. And those don't get headlines. The headlines that the colleges like to send out are like, oh, you know, we had the strongest application pool of, you know, in history. And look at our admitted numbers. They average these scores. So be careful what you're, what you're kind of, um, what, what data you're looking at. All right. I want to name that it is 801. We still Sorry. have unanswered questions in the chat, um, but I'm going to very quickly say that if you uh, defer your admission to a college, it really depends on whether that scholarship money is going to continue with you. So um, we will look at that on a case by case basis. There are total advantages to going the community college route and disadvantages when thinking about the UCs. Um, so if you are thinking that the UCs are the goal, we're going to talk about all the pathways in those one-on-one -on -one meetings to get to them. And um, community colleges can be an affordable and smart route for some um, students. And then ideal test dates for taking the SAT or ACT. I'm going to say that most folks should not start testing before maybe the February or March date of 2022, because you're going to want a little test prep time. Um, but then, you know, everything's on the table after that point. There are lots of um, winter, late spring, and then some summer test dates as well to try and potentially get two sittings in before we start senior year. All right, I wanna thank everybody for being here tonight. I'm gonna to push out this recording hopefully by the end of the week. Mr. McDonald always has to throw it on YouTube for me. So it all depends on how busy he is with the play. But thank you everyone for being here tonight. I hope this has been helpful. Keep an eye out for those questionnaires in your inbox in the morning and we'll have more soon. Good night. <laughs>